Welcome back, I'm Matt Chemist, and today we have five important papers in organic synthesis for the month of August 2023. The first paper for today involves the synthesis of tetrazoles from guanidines as well as amidines. In this paper, the authors were able to generate tetrazoles under relatively mild conditions. This process was transition metal free and was able to occur at room temperature in an aqueous solution. This chemistry follows another paper where this azide-based reagent was used to do an azide transfer, so regular amines could be converted into azides. In this case, because we have a guanidine or an amidine as our starting material, we're afforded with tetrazoles. The scope of this chemistry is quite good. If you'd like to see even more examples, you can check out the full paper. Halogens as well as ethers were well tolerated. Not only were unsubstituted tetrazoles synthetically accessible, but they were also able to make an n phenyl tetrazole, and in this case, this is a bicyclic tetrazole. Now, in addition to the amidines, the authors were able to use guanidines as well to make amino tetrazoles. The scope of this was also quite good, and you can even see some examples which are derivatives of amino acids, such as these ones which are derivatives of arginine. The reagent that the authors used is readily accessible from this imidazoleum-based sulfonyl fluoride, which can be substituted through the use of sodium azide, enabling the synthesis of fluorosulfuryl azide, which could be used in solution. You might be a little bit concerned about this reagent, it's got a very high nitrogen content, but the authors demonstrated that there was no thermal events when this compound in ether was heated. If you'd like to know more about this, I'd encourage you to check out the supporting information from this paper. The second paper for today involves the synthesis of azetidines using a strain release approach. Some highlights of this paper include the gram scale synthesis of azetidines with an all carbon quaternary center. The authors were able to use nickel 1 bromide, as well as an activator which was an N Bach group to ring open this three-membered ring and were subsequently afforded with their desired product after a couple steps. Now, you might be wondering about how these types of reagents are made. Initially, this dibromopropylamine is lithiated using n -buley. This enables the synthesis of this lithiated bicyclic species 1' prime, which is able to be trapped by various electrophiles, which for the most part the authors demonstrated with acyl halides, although they did also demonstrate an example where a sulfinyl halide could be used. There were a couple other examples, and if you're interested to see what the authors used entirely, I'd encourage you to check out the full paper. Now, the mechanism of this chemistry is as follows. Initially, the nitrogen gets functionalized by Bach anhydride. This enables nucleophilic ring opening by bromide, which is then able to be oxidized to a carbon-centered radical via this nickel-1 species. In this process, nickel-2 is formed, and the nickel-2 is then able to engage the radical which was formed to prepare a nickel-3 species. Once this nickel-3 species forms, Reductive elimination can occur, forming the desired product. This regenerates the nickel-1 bromide catalyst, which can be exchanged with the boronic acid, reforming the nickel-1 complex, which can engage with the tertiary bromide. The authors also have more mechanistic studies in their full paper. The authors demonstrated that this is applicable to a wide range of biorelevant molecules. These are the interesting examples in their paper. And aside from these examples where the boronic acid was a derivative of a biorelevant molecule, the authors also explored a more simple substrate scope. The authors also examined a range of different compounds which have various different functional groups. One of the interesting ones here is 5i. This is how the authors made 5i, but I wonder if today's sponsor Reaxis has any alternative ideas about how we can make this compound. Today we're going to test the break bond feature in the retrosynthesis portion of Reaxis. This is the molecule from the paper that we're reading. We're going to see if Reaxis can propose a synthesis, which includes the formation of this bond in the molecule. We're going to search the same way that we normally would using the Reaxis Retrosynthesis tool, and then we're going to predict the synthesis. Let's check out a few of the predicted routes that Reaxis has given us. We can see that there's several different proposed routes, and we're going to look at them in the tree view. The first reaction involves a pinnacle rearrangement, as well as a pinnacle coupling. This can be facilitated through the use of Lewis acids, and there's other examples in the literature that Reaxis is drawing from as shown here. I think the use of a pinnacle coupling with lithium is a little bit optimistic, but maybe I'm naive here. In addition to this proposed route, we have a few others, so let's check out another one. This route involves the aerylation of the existing azetidine using an aryl bromide as well as palladium catalysis. There are some examples in the literature that it's drawing from, but you can see this patent yield is only 6%. This one probably wouldn't work that well, but maybe it would be possible to obtain a hit using this protocol. This next route involves a dehydroazetidine and the addition of a boronic acid into that alkene. These other double bonds tends to be fairly different. This tends to be Michael addition, so I don't know if this route would work too well. There's another interesting step that they mentioned though, where the acylation of this enamine is done through the use of this mixed anhydride. Now, while most of the precedent involves the use of trifluoroacetic anhydride and 
That allows this enamine to be trifluoroacetylated. I'm not so sure that this would work with the mixed anhydride, but it's an interesting idea and I didn't know that this type of chemistry exists. Using this tool and the Reaxis retrosynthesis tool more broadly speaking, you can come up with more ideas that may help you in your research. Why don't you give Reaxis a try? I want to thank Reaxis for their support of this channel. The third paper for today is the total syntheses of these Hamagera and natural products. These natural products have a unique 675 tricyclic carbon skeleton. A couple of the neat steps that we're going to briefly talk about include the palladium catalyzed intramolecular cyclopropanol ring opening cross coupling through a Kolenkovich based cyclopropanol. The authors also used something called Tompkinson's reagent, which I thought was really interesting. Among the different Hamagera natural products that exist, the authors decided to target four of them. We're not going to be talking about the full total syntheses here, we're just going to be highlighting a couple of the interesting steps that I thought were worth noting. The first reaction I wanted to mention was they take this sterically unhindered lactone 27, and by doing the Kolenkovich reaction, they were able to put a cyclopropanol where the carbonyl of the lactone was, and in the same pot in a second step, they treat this with bis trifluorosulfonyl aniline, and this is able to triflate the corresponding phenol into a triflate. The Kolenkovich reaction is really cool. If you haven't seen it before, it's not a super well-known reaction. This is the Cori modification as the chloro triosopropoxy titanium was used. More or less what happens is ethyl magnesium bromide is able to attack the titanium. Once a bis ethyl titanium species is able to form, this can eliminate ethane and this forms a metallocyclopropane. This metallocyclopropane is a really good carbon-based nucleophile and this facilitates the formation of a cyclopropanol. The titanium for this reaction can be catalytic, but most of the time you'll see people use an excess since it's readily available and they're not too concerned about using a bit more of it. After the workup's done, this bis trifluorosulfonyl aniline is able to just do a triflate transfer to form the aryl triflate. Once this cyclopropanol triflate is formed, Cha's palladium catalyzed cyclopropanol ring opening enables the formation of the seven membered ring, which I thought was a really cool reaction. I hadn't seen this reaction before either. Now, in addition, I mentioned that Tompkinson's reagent. One of the steps in their total synthesis was the oxidation of the one position of this benzene ring. The authors used this Tompkinson's reagent in my favorite solvent hexafluoroisopropanol. It was able to oxidize either the one or the two position. Where the one was desired, the two is undesired. And the R group coming off of the phenol is just this ring open version of the Tompkinson's reagent. Now, the authors were pretty clever here. They were able to take the undesired product, deprotect it with methanol and potassium carbonate, form a triflate on that position, and reduce the triflate back to an aryl CH using palladium and formic acid. I really like this. I thought that this was a clever approach to use. Tompkinson's reagent is readily available. This can be formed through the cyclopropanation of diethylmalonate using dibromoethane, and subsequent hydrolysis affords the bis carboxylic acid. Additionally, the cyclopropane dicarboxylic acid can be treated with hydrogen peroxide as the urea complex to generate this peroxide bis lactone anhydride type species. I thought that this was a really cool reagent. I hadn't seen these types of oxidations before, and if you've ever seen this used in a paper before, I'd love to see more examples down in the comments. If you have an aryl oxidation you're struggling to do, this might be the reagent for you. The fourth paper for today involves the ozonolysis of substituted alkenes followed by copper mediated nitrogen carbon bond formation. The reaction featured a simple copper 1 chloride catalyst with 110 phenanthrolene as the ligand, and the authors demonstrated this up to a 50 millimole scale. Now, in terms of the scope, the paper was quite good. A number of different nitrogen based nucleophiles were able to be used, including nitrogen containing heterocycles, substituted anilines, as well as sulfonamides. In addition, the authors explored a range of different alkenes, such as these interesting ones here, like this derivative of theobromine. There's some other terpenoid based ones here. And I'd encourage you to check out the full paper for all of the examples that the authors used. I've often seen this 3-chloroindazole used, and I'm assuming that this just has better regioselectivity for this copper chemistry than other indazoles, but if you have an answer about why these 3-chloroindazoles were being used, I'd love to hear your theories down in the comments. I thought that this paper was pretty cool. The downside is obviously ozone still needs to be used. They also had to do a bit of workup between the first and second step, but overall the reaction seems quite appealing, especially when you can just delete off an alkene from some natural products that you might already have. So if you have some building blocks that you want to diversify, this might be an appealing strategy for you to check out. The fifth and final paper for today is this illid mediated cyclopropanation to make a chiral pyrimidine cyclopropane carboxylic acid. Some highlights of this paper include scale up to 1 to 2 mole scale, the exclusion of chromatography, and dabconium illid mediated cyclopropanation. The authors mentioned a number of different cyclopropanation strategies, which I thought I should include here in case you weren't familiar with these. 
The first one kind of resembles a Horner Wadsworth Emmons, but instead of using a carbonyl like an aldehyde or a ketone, using an epoxide, a cyclopropane was able to be formed. Some similar examples with other illids are seen here, such as the sulfonium-based illid, and ultimately the authors of this paper decided to try and use DABCO in a method similar to the one shown in equation 5 here. Now, before the authors got to this, their initial discovery route was as follows. Cross-coupling with vinyl B-pin afforded the vinyl pyrimidine 3. This could then be cyclopropanated using this diazo ester, which could be purified via column chromatography. Diazo compounds are often something people want to avoid, especially in medchem, so the authors opted to find an alternative synthesis. As diazo compounds want to be avoided, they're also somewhat energetic. After screening lots of conditions, the authors found that this dabconium illid worked quite well, and they were able to form the desired trans product over the cis product with 50 to 1 selectivity. That just means it was like 98% 13, 2% 14. Initially, they weren't able to get this to go to full conversion, but they found that if they ground the cesium carbonate, they were able to push the reaction to conversion. This enabled the authors to form product 13 as an oil in 86% yield. Even though this is 98% pure, they still wanted to get rid of that 2% impurity. After hydrolyzing the terputyl ester with TFA and DCM, the authors were able to crystallize out the desired product selectively, while leaving product 15 which was more polar in the mother liqueur. So product 1 is racemic, they weren't able to employ any alternative DABCO like chiral amines such as quinine, so unfortunately they had to do some sort of resolution. What they ended up finding out was that, using compound 18, they were able to crystallize out the desired enantiomer with decent selectivity. Following this overall protocol, the authors were able to produce multiple grams of the product, which could be pushed forward for subsequent testing. In addition to the five important papers for this month, we have several honorable mentions. My favorite among these is the esterification of thioamides to make thionoesters via selective CN bond cleavage under mild conditions. These authors succeeded where I failed, and I had tried employing an approach like this to make thionoesters, but these authors found a way that worked where mine failed. So congratulations to them on creating a new way to make thionoesters. I wonder if we'll see this approach being used in the future. I would hope so. So hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.